Steve, if you were my psychiatrist, I would tell you that I think about ultimate questions all the time. And I usually do it in two parts. I think about cosmology and the physics of it. And I think about theology, nature, existence of God. You've done something interesting. You've created a cosmotheology. So as soon as I saw that, I had to come see you. <laughs> <laughs> tell me about it. Well, cosmotheology is simply uh, a theology that takes the universe, what we know about the universe, into account. Uh, and I think most theologies now that we have do, do not do that. What do I mean by take the universe into account? Well, uh, first of all, the immense size of the universe now. Uh, you know, a uh, hundred years ago, the universe was believed to be only 3,500 light years in diameter. We now know that it's uh, billions and billions of light years in diameter. That's a, that's a big change. Just in a hundred years. Just in a hundred years. And you can imagine how it's changed from the time when these theologies were developed thousands of years ago. Also, I think uh, you need to take into account that we are no longer central in the, uh, in the universe in a, in a geographical sense, in a physical sense. Uh, we are on the outer uh, arms of our own Milky Way galaxy. Our own Milky Way galaxy is not, uh, is not in any way central. Uh, secondly, uh, if there is extraterrestrial life, uh, we are not in any way biologically central. Um, thirdly, uh, and that, that goes to the whole question of whether or not there's extraterrestrial life then. Thirdly, uh, there's the question of where we stand in the great chain of being. Uh, on the Earth, we see ourselves as at the, the apex of the great chain uh, where evolution has brought us by natural selection. Uh, if you take the whole universe into account and believe that there are extraterrestrials, some of whom might have existed for millions or billions of years even, it's very likely that we are not at the apex in the great chain of being, that we are maybe somewhere in the middle or even at the lower end. So any theology, any cosmotheology would have to take that into account, that we are not uh, central in any way in the great chain of being. And then uh, you get into the question of, of uh, God, the nature of God. Uh, I think in the modern, with modern science, one could well argue that uh, we have no need for the supernatural anymore. Uh, there may be, may well be still a need for God. I think uh, human history shows that uh, many people need a God. Whether or not a God exists, they need a God. Uh, but I say if we're going to have a God, why not have a natural God rather than a supernatural God? Um, uh, and I think there are many advantages to uh, having a natural God rather than a supernatural I God. I feel like I need a God, but the last thing I want to do is fool myself into believing there is a God when there isn't, even if it makes me feel better. That makes me feel much worse. Mm -hmm. So I want to be very rigorous in understanding is there a real God or not God. I don't need some artificial uh, pumping up of my emotions, even though I like it. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to, if, if I would believe that there is evidence for no God, uh, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily want to substitute anything. Why would I want to substitute something that's artificial? Well, what I do is uh, uh, start, I start from the premise that, there, that I don't believe in the supernatural. Um, so uh, if you have a need for God, I say that it should be, uh, a natural God. Now, uh, uh, let me explain that a little bit. Um, maybe the word God, of course, has all kinds of baggage <laughs> right. over the last thousands of years, and maybe you don't need to call this God. But in a, in a way, SETI is a, uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a kind of religious quest because it's searching for Beings superior... greater than yes, ourselves. Yes. superior intelligence. And so if you feel that, uh, you know, the extraterrestrial intelligence develops by natural selection, uh, going along over these many millennia or millions of years, then uh, in a way, uh, uh, the most advanced extraterrestrial in the universe would be what we think of as God. <laughs> now, uh, let me hasten to say that I don't think that uh, that necessarily means that uh, this is a, a, a being or, or, or uh, a God that would intervene in human affairs. Uh, there's not really any evidence uh, of that, I think. Uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, it, it would explain this uh, anthropic principle, this idea that the, that the laws of the universe and the constants of the universe are in, in such a way fine-tuned for life. It's possible that a, such a, an advanced being, natural being, 
uh, has tinkered with this. So uh, with those constants to produce life, I mean, if you consider you know, beings millions or billions of years old, maybe that's what they do. Uh, but uh, to me, that's more appealing than, uh, than a supernatural being that you, uh, that you say does all these things and intervenes in history. Well, certainly what you're saying reflects a human desire and a collective human need to find something beyond ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if in the past it has been expressed by looking for a supernatural being that caused us and intervened with us, it also motivates those who would seek to, to, to find extraterrestrial beings of great superior intelligence. So that motivation, interestingly, comes from the same inner source. I would say, though, that uh, in the case of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence people, I don't want to say that, <clears throat> that what they do is uh, look for, uh, that, that the project, the SETI project, is deities for atheists. Uh, that's <laughs> not, uh, I don't think that's their primary motivation. And that claim actually has been made by some of their critics, <laughs> that it's deities for atheists. I think it's a, an important scientific problem, uh, which has theological implications. And one of the implications is, is that you may have extraterrestrial beings out there that are much more uh, of a superior intelligence than we are, approaching, uh, given the billions of years that they could have existed, approaching the characteristics that we now impute to a supernatural God. How do you see your cosmotheology developing? What are some guideposts that I could look to? I, I'm talking to cosmologists and the pure cosmology of the structure of the universe, and some of them conclude it's rather pointless, beautiful maybe, but pointless. Theologians obviously have their whole scenarios and systems internally consistent in some cases to deal with multiple universes within their world. But from your point of view, what can I do to look for signs or symbols or demonstrations that your way is, is perhaps a, a, a proper way of, of, of a modern understanding of reality? Well, I think the key is that uh, the assumption that I start with is that there is nothing supernatural. Uh, it's, it's sort of like Einstein, although I'm, I don't want to compare myself to <laughs> Einstein, but uh, Einstein started with a premise that the speed of light was constant and everything else that he did you know, in special relativity and general relativity depended on that premise. If you start with the premise that there is nothing supernatural and see where that goes, uh, and uh, in terms of extraterrestrial intelligence, you see that there could be extremely intelligent and superior uh, extraterrestrial beings out there which approach the, uh, you know, what we now think of as God. Now, you don't necessarily need to call that God. In fact, maybe you should call it something else. I'm just saying that uh, that, that, is a, that is something that science can look at, at least has a chance of looking at. Uh, science cannot approach uh, a supernatural God by definition. And uh, of course, uh, a lot of people would say, would, would want to keep it just that way, that theology is not supposed to be approachable by, uh, by, uh, by, by science. So I think that would mean that a critical data point, indeed a, a, a guidepost for me, would be that if we indeed find some extraterrestrial signal, so to speak, mm -hmm. tomorrow or whenever, that that would be a, a, an extremely important piece of confirmatory evidence that your cosmotheology may be a very good way to look at the world. Well, it would depend on uh, the, the, the nature of the intelligence, how you know what their characteristics were, and that sort of thing. Uh, but. Um, well, I mean, take the worst, assume they're malevolent. It would still indicate that we have to develop a cosmotheology based upon extraterrestrial beings, uh, and uh, this is something that we had better pay attention to. Well, that's true. In the most general sense, uh, that cosmotheology is a theology that takes into account what we know about the universe. If there are extraterrestrials, then you get into the whole scenario of uh, having to adjust your current theologies or throw the current theologies overboard and start with something new. Uh, and, uh, and that's what uh, uh, cosmotheology does, is uh, really pay attention to what we know about the universe. Uh, I'm always reminded of uh, one uh, thing that my friend Arthur C. Clarke said, and that is that any faith that can't survive collision with the truth is not worth many regrets. <laughs> and I would whole wholeheartedly endorse that. 
uh, you know, uh, it, it, it took the church, the Catholic church, what, four or five hundred years to, uh, well, four hundred years or something like that to uh, admit that the, the world was, uh, the sun was in the center. Uh, they're still arguing about evolution now after 150 years. Uh, but I think uh, that uh, the primary consideration for any theology, if you need a theology, is to take into account reality, what we know about the universe. Steve, thou almost converteth me to <laughs> cosmotheology. Uh, uh, have you had people seriously uh, be interested in, in this as a something that they want to become involved with in some way? Well, I have had some reactions to this, uh, to this idea, uh, and I think that in a way it's a middle ground uh, because uh, people who are currently religious, it's too big a step for them to, to become atheists. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, uh, to uh, consider a natural God, uh, which may have many of the, many of the characteristics of, uh, of the uh, current God, but is not supernatural, uh, some people may be willing to accept. And also to embed within it all the data of cosmology, which comes in it seems almost every month there's something new and exciting that enriches that theology. That's right, and the key point is that uh, it's something that is accessible to science. Uh, and and the, uh, the other key point is that uh, there's no reason to have this dichotomy which we have now between the natural and the supernatural. I mean, a lot of people, uh, you know, they'll poo-poo a belief in ghosts, but yet they believe in the Holy Ghost, you know. <laughs> it's, it's not uh, consistent. So. I think the idea that, uh, that we need to deal with only within the realm of the natural, which is a, a, uh, enough of a challenge, uh, is uh, something that can be applied to uh, theology. I can give you one piece of advice, that when you decide which day to hold your services, you only have Monday through Thursday as options because Friday, of course, is Islam and uh, Saturday is Judaism <laughs> and, sun and Sunday is Christianity. So you, you have one of four choices and uh, let me know and uh, I'll come to the first service. Well, I'm not sure we need services except uh, as a philosophical discussion, you know. <laughs>